Well, it's awesome to, uh, to be here today. We've been looking forward to this day for quite a while. And we're going to talk, have a great talk today, and we're going to look at Jesus. And the topic is a life-changing lunch. And we're going to look at Jesus. He had a lunch with a woman at the well, which is a story that many of you have heard. Uh, but I've been praying about and searching and... You don't know how many passages I looked at before I picked this one because it's something that I believe that I need and it's something that we all need. And the amazing thing when you read about Jesus is wherever he went, lives were changed. He shocked people every day. The disciples got up with him and just time after time they looked at each other and said, Who is this guy that we're with? And that is who we get to follow. And I'm excited to talk about a life-changing lunch uh, that they had. And I want to talk first here um, about another life-changing lunch. Uh, this is our wedding picture there back in the day. And in 1995, we had a life-changing lunch before we started liking each other. When we went up to lead the church in Vermont, we sat down, I don't remember what place it was, but it was about the conversation that I remember. And Danielle shared, she just had been through this breakup in the church with this guy, and they had dated twice, and they broke up twice, and it was kind of like, this is it. And she looked at me after telling me the story, and she said, right now, I, I'm having trouble trusting men. And I remember hearing that, and guys, you know, we need a challenge sometimes, right? Yeah. So she said that, and immediately, without even thinking about it, I said, I want to be someone you can trust. Amen. The challenge was issued, and I was up for it. Come on, bro. Lay it out. And within a few months, uh, we were falling in love, and about a year later, we were getting married. Come on. You know, that was what I call a life-changing lunch. Yeah. I'll never forget that lunch. Yeah. It was an amazing time. We're going to look at one of those lunches today. You know, the best marriage advice I ever got was the simplest. And I like simple because I can remember simple. <laughs> Have lunch every week with your wife. Yeah. Encourage her with all the things she's doing good and share one thing that she can do differently. And let her do the same thing to you. That one piece of advice changed our lives. Every Monday we put this into practice, not just because it was good advice, but because it actually works. Yeah. When you don't let things build up and you get them out and you encourage each other, guess what? Your relationship works. Man, there's times when I wish we would have done that. The times we've forgotten is when we've had issues in our lives. So if you don't get anything else out of church, that works with any relationship, not just marriage. That works with your roommates. That works with your coworkers, with your boss, whatever. Take them out to lunch. Tell them how much you love them and something you wish they would change. And man, that'll help your relationship. And if you're taking your boss out and you say that, then make sure you pay. So sometimes we go to Panera. Right? We get the two for lunch at Panera. And I always get the two flatbreads because you, it fills you up more, right? We go to, we get pho. Where's that? There we go. We want to get healthy. We do the pho thing. We do sushi. Oh, where are we going here? Sometimes we do this, right? You know, you're trying to get healthy. I know there's a lot of us trying to do that right now. My clicker, can you go back one? Back, back one. There you go. We do sushi. Now go forward. Okay, we do this. If you're really in trouble, you do this, right? <laughs> That's just, you know, I'm sorry. If you're on this, that's depressing. When I have to eat that, I'm not too happy. But I've done it. You know, I've done it. Whatever you got to do, right? You know, when I hang out with the teens, I have a lot more fun because we do this. Oh, man. We go to cellos. We get the, you know, we get the biggest, greasiest burger we can imagine. It's the best thing. Those are life-changing lunches. We went through, through the teen class and what encourages you? And everybody said food, not just the boys, the girls too. So you want to encourage your kid? Go take them out for one of these. 
Okay, let's get back into it. Let's say a prayer uh, as we're having fun, and we'll get started. Uh, Father, we do pray that you be with this time. I uh, pray that the next uh, few minutes as we look at Jesus, that you'll, you'll open up our hearts, God. Help us to see you. Help us to have a life-changing time, God, because we're with you. Uh, get me out of the way, and we pray your spirit to move. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, in John chapter 4, starting in verse 1, I need my Bible. Bible. Probably need a Bible. You, some of you can get your Bibles out too. I know you're used to reading it up here. In John chapter 4, it says, The Pharisees had heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although in fact it was not Jesus who baptized but his disciples. When the Lord learned of this, he went to Judea and left Judea and went back to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. He came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour, about noon. That's why we're calling this a lunch. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Now, first of all, Jesus chose to go through Samaria because he was one of the few people in his day that wasn't prejudiced. Amen. He went through Samaria for a reason because everybody else went around Samaria because there was a huge thing with the Jews the Jews hated the Gentiles and they hated the Samaritans even more because the Samaritans, when, they were, when uh, Israel was conquered, they, they were taken away to Assyria and, and the Assyrians all moved in and they all intermarried and they brought their foreign gods and they had all these children that didn't know God and so the Jews just hated them with a passion. But I love Jesus because he was determined to break down every single barrier Amen. of race of gender, of eco economics, of culture, and even of morality. Amen. You know, for this woman, this was the most positive conversation that she had ever had. And I believe it was the only time in her life that a Jewish man talked to her at this time. Because in that time, it was disrespectful for a Jewish man even to talk to his wife in public was disrespectful. And so for him to talk to a Samaritan woman was unheard of. That's why she was shocked. What are you doing talking to me? And she was blown away for this lunch that she didn't know that she needed. As she snuck out there, maybe it was noon, she went out there when no one else was there so she could kind of hide. Or maybe there was an emergency and she had to get out there and get water. But she ended up running into Jesus and it changed everything. My question for you today is, are you thirsty? Are you thirsty? Are you parched? I mean, really thirsty. I mean, I'm serious. Who, who's really thirsty? I have been preparing this for you all day, okay? I put this in the freezer. I have ice in here to keep it nice and cold. So I want to know who is the thirstiest person in here. I mean, put your hand up. I mean, if you're not, your hand's not up, you're not thirsty. Okay. Okay, Paige was actually looking pretty thirsty here. So I'm going to get, this is very quality uh, Kirkland water right here. <laughs> We got to see how it is first. It was, it's even got ice in it still. So if you're hot, man, she's loving it. Okay. I wish we could have had that on camera. You know, right now, if you're not thirsty, your lunch with Jesus is over. If you're not thirsty for something in your life, then your time with Jesus is, is useless. Because he came for the people who were thirsty. Those who were all set, he walked right by, and they walked right by him. You know, are you, what, are you looking to change your life? And he continued with this conversation with the woman. He said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. You would be asking me for a drink of this, what I have that is more valuable than what, you're ask, what I'm asking you for. He said, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. 
Indeed, the water I give them will become a spring of water welling up to eternal life. That she came for water, but Jesus had something else in mind. I don't know why you came today. I don't know what you need in your life right now. But Jesus wants to give you something maybe even different than what you think you need. Amen. My point number one, drink living water. It's about filling up with living water. This world that we live in is hurting. Read me. You know, fill up with the Spirit. Fill up with God's Word. You know, when was the last time that you just got up and just said, man, i got to get in the Bible? In this world, we're searching for love. We're searching for relationships, for self-esteem, for respect, for connection. So we're trying to escape. We're trying to avoid. We're trying to belong. And we're trying to change. But only the living water can change us. Only Jesus can change you. Have you been searching or struggling or desiring change? Yeah. Amen. Because that means you're thirsty. Maybe you didn't know you were thirsty for Jesus, but she didn't know she was either. Yeah. You've been trying to change yourself, change your family, change your job, get more money. Like that's going to help fill you up. But I'm here to tell you today that it's not. That's right. You can go after everything in this world, and if you don't fill up with Jesus, you'll still be thirsty. And you'll still be empty. And that is the world that we live in. Before I found Jesus, I was stuck. I'd gone through the same cycle so many times of sin that it was not going to change. And I was 18. That's a lot of sin before I was 18. I wanted to make a difference, but I had no character. And I wasn't an honest person. I was surrounded by hypocrisy and sin, and most of it was mine. I went to church hungover almost every week. And yet I felt better than everyone else around me because at least I was there. I was so thirsty, and I didn't know that I had nothing to drink. You know, these last few couple of months, as we've gone through these different changes in the church, I hope that it's driven you to pray more, to search for God more, to look for answers. Amen. Not just for the church, not just for somebody else, but for you, for me. Amen. I realized a lot in my own character. And man, my prayer books are full. They're filled up. Every single day. Because it's a shame, but sometimes it takes us to get desperate. To really reach out to God. Yeah. Sometimes we got to get in a desperate place before we start reaching out. Why is that? Why can't we just seek God now? But whatever He does that makes us seek Him is a blessing. You know, one of the things that I've realized through some help from my friends here is the need to speak up more. They need to talk to people about things that I see to not fear conflict. And I realize as I've been searching my heart on this and wondering what's going on, I've realized two things. That I'm selfish and I'm unloving. Because in a lot of situations, you know how it, all, it is, and you probably see it too. Somebody makes a weird comment and you go, oh, that was weird. And then you have a choice. Well, I'm going to talk to them about it or I'm going to go, well, they're probably going to figure it out. They're good, brother. Uh, uh, he's probably good. And then somebody else does it, and then you have this whole backpack of stuff that you go, man, I could have all these conversations, or, or not. Right. right? And so I've made the decision at different times, saying, well, you know what? That's two hours right there of talking to this person and that person and that person. I don't really want to deal with that. I got a lot going on. I got a, stuff to do. The teens are all over the place. My family, you know. But that was where I realized it, that's not loving. Because I'm not thinking about, well, what do they need? What if, what if I'm the one that God's going to use? And if, if, if it was nothing, then amen is nothing. I don't have to worry about it. You know, but so, our, our self can get in the way. That's why Jesus said, if you don't deny yourself, you can't be my disciple. You know, what, what I've realized as we've talked more and more is that that's not just me. 
That's all of us. That's sometimes at church you can have a culture of that. Where everybody sees everything because we all have the spirit, but we all assume, oh, everything's probably good. You know, sometimes it's not good. You know, there's a lot of us that are hurting, and maybe God wants to use you to help them. So in these last couple of months, I've spoke up so many times, and so many after every single meeting, more multiple times, after so many conversations, after church, I'm making a list of people I need to talk to out of love. Amen. Because it's not about me, it's about all of us. Right. Yeah. Right. You know, it's not about you getting having a great church service. Right. It's about you serving God, loving God, and helping your brother and sister. Right. Yeah. Right. And so that, to me, that's what we need as a church. Right. If you want me to pick one thing, that's it. Yeah. Come on. Speak the truth in love. Expect the best, but still have the conversation. That's what I'm learning. And I pray that that's what we're all learning. Because that's what Jesus did here in this conversation. Got to read our Bible there. Little did this woman know, 600 years ago, Jeremiah wrote this scripture, My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. The only time that that's referenced in the New Testament is right here with this Samaritan woman. That this prophecy came true on this woman who was the worst person in her entire village. And yet Jesus took the time to have a, a conversation with her. He says it again in chapter 17 of Jeremiah. He says it in Zechariah 7, 14. You can just write down the references. But what an amazing thing that God prophesied about this woman. She went to the well for who knows what, and she was going to be fulfilling hundreds of years of prophecy about the Christ. Amen. <clears throat> Imagine when she went back and she started reading it and said, Wow, Jesus talked to me about this. That I was the first one to hear about this. That's pretty life changing. Are you thirsty? The story continues. In verse 15, Jesus has these conversation with her. He says, Go call your husband and come back. She says, I don't have a husband. He says, you're right, you've had five husbands. The, woman you're, the, the man you're with right now is not your husband. And she says, well, I can see you're a prophet. And then she starts talking about, well, I thought we're supposed to worship on this mountain. Are we supposed to worship here? Are we supposed to worship in Jerusalem? And Jesus continues in verse 20, 21. He says, believe me, woman. A time is coming where you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah called the Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. Wow! We're talking about mountains. He's getting personal. She's trying to change the subject. You know how we do that? We want to change, but when someone actually talks about something that we can change, we want to talk about mountains. And we want to have religious discussions that sound so awesome. If you want to change your heart, you've got to deal with your heart. If you want a new life, you've got to take responsibility for the decisions you've made and make them right. And Jesus knew that. That's what he was doing. And then at the end, imagine her amazement to realize she was talking with the Messiah. That the Messiah walked all the way through Samaria, didn't talk to anybody else except for me. Imagine how she felt. Wow. 
I thought I was a nothing. I thought I was a nobody. I thought my life was over. I had no respect, even for myself. I'm worth nothing. And yet the Messiah came and talked to me. That changed her whole life. He wasn't speaking down to her even when he talked about her sin. He was helping her. And she knew it. And she felt loved. He wasn't down on her. He was up on her. Amen. He knew this was going to happen. My point number two is, are you hungry? <laughs> I love that picture. Who, who do you think is the most hungry person in here right now? <laughs> it can't be the same person. <laughs> kind of like somebody who's not super healthy too. Okay. Oh, wow. We got somebody really excited in the back there. Who is that? Is that Jerry? Okay, Jerry. You're... you're. Jerry, you get some Skittles. You can share them with your kids or, and be nice, or you can finish them up here. So Jesus is talking with this woman, and the guys come up, and then he talks about eating spiritual food here. He says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying? It's still four months until the harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the harvest. They are ripe for the harvest. Even now the one who reaps draws a wage and the harvest a crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. So the disciples come back. They're wondering if Jesus ate, if he had lunch. That's where the lunch comes in. And Jesus said, I don't, I don't care about lunch. Don't you see I've been, help, I've been doing God's work. I've been helping her. I've been, I've been pouring out my... I don't, I, don't want, I don't need to eat. You know, he, he never even says that he got the drink of water. She didn't even like use the jug. So he didn't eat and he didn't drink. But it was still life-changing lunch. Sort of. Sort of lunch, but very life-changing. You know, what I realized, too, is that we're never going to be filled up until we're doing God's work. Amen. We're never going to be complete. We're never going to be filled with joy. We're never going to be where we need to be with God if we're not doing those two things. Finishing His work and doing His will. Amen. If you're not trying to obey God, then you're not pleasing God. That's what He's saying. Yeah. If you're going after all these other kinds of food and you're not trying to put God's Word into your life, then your lunch is over. But that's not why we're here. We're here to be able to do God's will Amen. and put it into our lives. To work, to love, to have faith. This is the thing that hit me was a challenge to my faith. Wow, the harvest is ripe right now. As ripe as it ever was. There's Danielle's out there right now. In your neighborhood, in your work, and you're around you. See, the lunch wasn't just for the woman at the well. Even though that's what it's called in your Bible on top. The second part of the lunch was for the disciples. The woman was good already. She was already in motion. She was telling the whole village, man. She was already changing. But the disciples needed to change too. Yeah. And I put before you, it was probably more important for them to change. Because the whole world was in their hands. You know, we can look and say, wow, isn't that great? We want to meet new people. But really, Jesus wasn't talking about new people. He was talking about you. And he was talking about me. It wasn't some big thing to go out on a campaign and start sharing with a bunch of people. It was to change your faith. Change my faith. Change their faith. Amen. To say, don't be discouraged. Don't be down. Don't think of all the people that didn't want to come. Don't think of all the times you shared your faith and people didn't do it. Or times you studied the Bible with people and they walked away. That's between them and God. But the fields are open now. And we're seeing that. But I pray that we can all have those eyes. That we're not searching after where are we going to eat? What's for dinner? What's this? What's that? 
Jesus wasn't. He chose the lowliest person around and said, man, if she can change, how is she going to inspire everybody else? And he did that over and over. It wasn't just her, but th this is amazing. Point number two, eat spiritual food. And somebody got the idea to write the gifts of the Spirit on all this fruit, self-control, patience, faithfulness, kindness. You know, do God's work. Be faithful. And strive to finish His work. He's given each of us as disciples some work to do. He's given us people in our lives. And He's given us a choice to choose to have faith. And all the lunches and dinners in the world aren't going to last if you're not feeding your soul. Amen. If you're not feeding your soul, then you're wasting your life. And I'm wasting my life. If you're feeding your soul, you're preparing yourself for eternity. You know, I wanted to take this time to uh, thank the church here. Shoot, I cried in Kate's kingdom too. <laughs> you know, you have opened your arms to us these past few years. We were blown away when we came here. You have restored our dreams for God. You have given us amazing friendships. And this past April, you, you guys uh, were part of something uh, life-changing for us and our family, our son getting baptized you know I was just thinking about all the guys that have got in there with him over the past three years Darren Abe Chevy Poncho Kevin Rick Danny Gabe James Drake Jacob David and I just thought wow this was a, an amazing victory for our family but it was all of us it took all of us and probably more that I didn't even think about that have influenced and helped and been examples and inspirations you know so I want to thank you for that Amen. for welcoming us uh, someone uh, said to me recently that you know we don't have any studies going on but we want our adults to even study with the kids in the church and I was driving home and I was thinking man no that's not good that should be the best thing that we do, is get with the kids in the church. That's the, that should be the most important thing when we wake up and so go, man, I need to get with the kids in the church first. Yeah. Why do I want to go save the world if I can't even save our kids? That's the greatest thing that you can do. If you don't have someone that you're studying with, you got hundreds of, you got 50 people right now. Yeah. You can take them out for food, for coffee, for a burger, whatever. Have, what, have a spiritual talk have a prayer read half a scripture whatever wherever they're at because there's some of our kids that are falling through That's right. and some of us aren't even aware that that's happening some of our teens they're falling through you know some people know who we're talking about because not all of us are really dialed in on that that should be the, that should, that's what we're good at, guys. Yeah. That's us. But we need to get focused on that. And I realized as I was uh, driving home thinking about all this, it, was, it wasn't until I moved here that I even had that so deep. That that was you. You gave that to me. You know, we're all trying to help each other. And it was the convictions and the families out here that really inspired me because I wasn't necessarily on that plan. But I am now. Amen. And I believe that's the future of the church. Amen. I believe we can have 50 teens in this church. And all their parents and all their grandparents and everybody. That, that I believe, is the future of where we need to go. Amen. And I'm not lobbying for anybody in particular. I'm just saying that I've seen it. I've been a part of it. I've been immersed in that. And I believe we have a lot of other work to do too. But we got to start there. And we got to keep going to everybody else. Campus, singles, young marrieds. 
We, we do pretty good with the older marrieds, right? We're all in there. <laughs> Got to get a little younger, though. So the conclusion, the woman went out. She went back to the village. Everybody else came back. Jesus ended up staying there for two whole days. He changed his schedule to stay there. And everybody was saying, if she can change, then I can too. If she can change, I can too. You know, they gave the teens a challenge at teen camp. Think about the one kid in your school that nobody thinks can change. And pray for him every day, or her. Because if that person changes, then the whole school will know right. that there's a God. Amen. That's what Jesus did. Yeah. The one person that took away everybody's excuse. <clears throat> and he changed her. And she became the ambassador for their, their, communi their community. I, I'm going to call all of us to raise our faith to that person, to start praying, to have greater faith that God wants to do that today with you, with me, now. Amen. Let's decide that we're going to go after living water and spiritual food. That we'll be really willing to get real and be willing to give up our time and be willing to love each other enough and to love our friends enough to have conversations and most of all to open up our eyes to what God is doing thank you guys